sutta that the Buddha spoke eh, in the world. Eh. It's called the Dhamma Chakra Pavatthana Sutta. Setting in motion the wheel of the Dhamma. Dhamma Chakra is Dhamma wheel. Eh. Pavatthana must be setting in motion or turning, turning the Dhamma wheel sutta. Eh. Thus have I heard. This is the sutta. After the Buddha was enlightened, eh, he contemplated... Oh, at first, he didn't want to teach the Dhamma. La. He decided uh, that all, uh, people in the world uh, are not interested in the Dhamma. La. And even if you teach them, uh, they're not interested to practice. La. Most people are like that. La. And then this uh, Brahma Sahampati uh, came to plead with the Buddha. La. This Brahma Sahampati, uh, in one of the suttas, uh, he mentioned uh, that he was a monk uh, under the previous Buddha, Kasapa. He was a monk uh, under the previous Buddha Kasapa and passing away from there, uh, he was reborn as Brahma Sahampati. So he had, because of his, uh, I guess his psychic power, uh, probably he had seen uh, a lot of holy men. So when he saw the Buddha, uh, he knew uh, that this was a fully enlightened uh, Arahan. So he pleaded with the Buddha to teach. Uh, he said, otherwise, uh, there are a lot of people in the world, uh, they have what we call Shinkan, uh, good roots, uh, blessings uh, from the past life and uh, you don't teach them, uh, they can't progress. Uh. So because uh, he pleaded with the Buddha three times, uh, then the Buddha contemplated again. Uh, the Buddha found uh, there are some people uh, who are interested in the Dhamma. Uh, so the Buddha t- decided to teach. Now after the Buddha decided to teach, uh, he looked around, uh, whom should he teach? Uh, the f- first person uh, he thought he wanted to teach uh, was his meditation teacher, the teacher who taught him the jhanas, the arupa jhanas, the first two teachers, in fact, he wanted to teach them. Why? Because he thought to himself, these two teachers, they have attained jhanas, so their mind is very clear. If I teach them the dhamma, they will understand immediately. But unfortunately, the two teachers had passed on. Then why didn't he go to heaven to teach them? Because they had passed away to a very high heaven, and the physical body cannot go there. Uh, the physical body uh, can only fly up to the Brahma heavens. Uh, that's the maximum. Uh, cannot fly to the Arupa heavens, uh, extremely far away. So then uh, after he realized that he had passed away, uh, then he contemplated uh, whom should he teach next. Uh, and he thought about his five disciples. So he came to his five disciples uh, to teach to them. Uh, at first they did not accept him uh, because they thought uh, that he started to eat uh, Previously, they were all fasting and now he started to eat, uh, getting luxurious. Uh. They couldn't believe that he had become enlightened. Uh. Then he managed to convince them. Uh. Then after that, uh, when he taught them the Dhamma, he just asked them to sit down. He said, sit down, I will teach you the Dhamma. Never ask them to meditate, you know. Uh, listening to the Dhamma is, is the way to enlightenment. Uh. But of course, because the five disciples, uh, being his disciples, uh, and he had attained jhana, it is logical uh, to presume uh, he would have taught all his five disciples the jhanas. Uh, uh. So they sat down, uh, and this is the first sutta he taught. Uh. Thus have I heard, on one occasion, the Blessed One was dwelling at Baranasi in the deer park at Isipatana. There the Blessed One addressed the monks of the group of five, thus, Monks, these two extremes should not be followed by one who has gone forth into homelessness, but two, the pursuit of sensual happiness in sensual pleasures, which is low, vulgar, the world of worldlings, the way of worldlings, ignoble, unbeneficial, and the pursuit of self-mortification, which is painful, ignoble, unbeneficial. Without veering towards either of these two extremes, the Tathagata has awakened to the middle way, which gives rise to vision, which gives rise to knowledge, which leads to peace, to direct knowledge, to enlightenment, to Nibbana. Stop here for a moment. So the Buddha is saying uh, that there are two extremes in this world. Uh. One extreme uh, is the extreme of ordinary worldlings uh, who pursue sensual pleasures, uh, keep on enjoying sensual pleasures, uh, uh, which is unbeneficial. Uh. The other extreme uh, is the extreme of the ascetics uh, who practice self mortification in Chinese we call it Ku Sing, uh, ascetic practices la, which uh, they kind of torture themselves, la, go naked, uh, do things like hold their uh, one hand up uh, for years on end uh, until the hand becomes stiff. Uh, uh, or 
or other ways of uh, torturing themselves. So one is uh, one extreme is to enjoy too much. The other way, the other extreme uh, is to torture yourself uh, for no good purpose. Uh. And what monks is the middle way awakened to by the Tathagata, which gives rise to vision, which leads to Nibbana. It is this noble eightfold path that is right view, right thoughts, right speech, right actions, right livelihood, right effort, right recollection, right concentration. This monks is that middle way awakened to by the Tathagata, which gives rise to vision, which gives rise to knowledge, which leads to peace, to direct knowledge, to enlightenment, to Nibbana. Now this monks is the noble truth of suffering. Birth is suffering, aging is suffering, illness is suffering, death is suffering, union with what is displeasing is suffering, separation from what is pleasing is suffering. Not to get what one wants is suffering. In brief, the five aggregates of attachment are suffering. These are five aggregates huh, are the body, feelings, perception, volition and consciousness, which is basically body and mind. Huh. So this that we take as to be the self, huh, the body and the mind, huh, and which we attach to, huh, we cling to, huh, is the source of suffering. Huh. Now this monks is the noble truth of the origin of suffering. It is this craving which leads to renewed existence, accompanied by delight and lust, seeking delight here and there, that is, craving for sensual pleasures, craving for existence, and craving for non-existence, or here it says extermination. Stop here for a moment. So the origin of suffering is craving. And this craving, uh, we always want to uh, seek happiness, enjoyment here and there. Uh, you see this seeking delight here and there. It's very common uh, among uh, worldly people. Uh, you go here and there looking for happiness, uh, looking for enjoyment. Uh, sometimes you go and see the show. Sometimes you go and surf the internet. Sometimes you go traveling to China. Uh, suddenly you do this and you do that. And all of these are trying to find uh, happiness. Now this monks is the noble truth of the cessation of suffering. It is the remainderless fading away and cessation of that same craving, the giving up and relinquishing of it, freedom from it, non-reliance on it. Now this monks is the noble truth of the way leading to the cessation of suffering. It is this noble eightfold path that is right view, right thoughts, right speech, right action, etc. This is the noble truth of suffering. Thus monks, in regard to things unheard of before, there arose in me vision, knowledge, wisdom, true knowledge and light. This noble truth of suffering is to be fully understood. Thus, monks, in regard to things unheard of before, there arose in me vision, knowledge, wisdom, true knowledge and light. This noble truth of suffering has been fully understood. Thus, monks, in regard to things unheard before, there arose in me vision, knowledge, wisdom, true knowledge and light. I'll stop here for a moment. Huh? So you see, this first noble truth huh, uh, is described huh, in three phases. Huh? The first one is he describes, he calls it, huh, or he describes it huh, as the noble truth of suffering. The second paragraph, huh, he says, huh, this noble truth of suffering is to be understood. And the third one huh, has been fully understood. Uh, now you find the others also the same. Huh? This is the noble truth of the origin of suffering. Thus, monks, in regard to things unheard before, there arose in me vision, knowledge, wisdom, true knowledge and light. This noble truth of the origin of suffering is to be abandoned. Thus, monks, in regard to things unheard before, there arose in me vision, knowledge, wisdom, true knowledge and light. This noble truth of the origin of suffering has been abandoned. Thus, monks, in regard to things unheard before, there arose in me vision, knowledge, wisdom, true knowledge and light. Stop here for a moment. Huh? So this second noble truth, huh? first he states the second noble truth. Then he says, huh? this second noble truth huh? the, uh, is the origin of suffering, huh? namely craving. Huh? A craving is to be abandoned. And thirdly, he says, huh? uh, craving has been abandoned. This is the noble truth of the cessation of suffering. Thus, monks, in regard to things unheard before, there arose in me vision, knowledge, wisdom, true knowledge and light. 
This noble truth of the cessation of suffering is to be realized. Thus, monks, in regard to things unheard before, there arose in me vision, knowledge, wisdom, true knowledge and light. This noble truth of the cessation of suffering has been realized. Thus, monks, in regard to things unheard before, there arose in me vision, knowledge, wisdom, true knowledge and light. Mm. Uh, this uh, truth uh, of the cessation of suffering uh, is the giving up of craving. Uh, so this uh, noble truth of the cessation of suffering uh, can also set uh, to be the attainment of uh, Nibbana. Uh, so here he says uh, that he has realized, uh, realized the cessation of suffering. Uh, this noble truth of the way leading to the cessation of suffering. This monks, in regard to, think, to things unheard before, there arose in me vision, knowledge, wisdom, true knowledge and light. This noble truth of the way leading to the cessation of suffering is to be developed. That means the noble eightfold path is to be developed. Thus monks, in regard to things unheard before, there arose in me vision, knowledge, wisdom, true knowledge and light. This noble truth of the way leading to the cessation of suffering has been developed. Thus, monks, in regard to things unheard before, there arose in me vision, knowledge, wisdom, true knowledge and light. Uh, stop there for a moment. Uh. You see, uh, when the Buddha attained enlightenment, uh, when he realized fully uh, these four noble truths, uh, uh, you think, see what happened. Uh, he arose in me vision, knowledge, wisdom, true knowledge and light. Uh, light uh, shone from his head. Uh, uh. Actually, these four noble truths uh, he had understood before in the previous life. Uh, he was a monk disciple of the Buddha Kasapa. He already learned the four noble truths, but he had not fully understood it. Now, in his last life as Siddhartha Gautama, having attained the four jhanas, uh, and then when he contemplated on the four noble truths, uh, he understood fully. In the previous life under the Buddha Kasapa, I believe uh, he did not attain the four jhanas. He attained uh, one jhana. That's why uh, after that lifetime under the Buddha Kasapa, he was reborn in the Tusita heaven. From the Tusita heaven, he came down to the earth uh, as Siddhartha Gautama. And as a small boy, uh, Siddhartha Gautama uh, sat under the Jambu tree uh, and attained the first jhana. Uh, it's mentioned uh, that he attained only the first jhana. Uh, so that means he probably had already cultivated only the first jhana, not, not anything higher. So if he had only attained the first jhana, this understanding uh, of the Four Noble Truths uh, is not, as we read, uh, not of swift wisdom, not of joyous wisdom. Uh, so he probably, uh, in the previous life under Buddha Kasapa, he had become a Sakadagamin, second fruit attainer. So when he came back as Siddhartha Gautama, it was time for him to attain enlightenment. Uh, so that's how, uh, even though he had such a good life, uh, he gave up everything uh, and went forth, uh, renounced everything. So long, monks, as my knowledge and vision of these four noble truths as they really are in the three phases and twelve aspects was not thoroughly purified in this way. I did not claim to have awakened to the unsurpassed perfect enlightenment in this world with its devas, mara and brahma, in this generation with its ascetics and brahmins, its devas and humans. But when my knowledge and vision of these four noble truths as they really are in the three phases and twelve aspects was thoroughly purified in this way. Then I claim to have awakened to the unsurpassed perfect enlightenment in this world with its devas, mara and brahma, in this generation with its ascetics and brahmins, its devas and humans. The knowledge and vision arose in me. Unshakable is the liberation of my mind. This is my last birth. Now there is no more renewed existence. This is what the Blessed One said. Elated, the monks of the group of five delighted in the Blessed One's statement. And while this discourse was being spoken, there arose in the Venerable Kondanya, the dust-free, stainless vision of the Dhamma. Whatever is subject to origination is all subject to cessation. And when the wheel of the Dhamma had been set in motion by the Blessed One, the earth-dwelling devas raised a cry. At Baranasi, in the deer park at Isipatana, this unsurpassed wheel of the Dhamma has been set in motion by the Blessed One, which cannot be stopped by any ascetic or Brahmin or Deva or Mara or Brahma, or by anyone in the world. Having heard the cry of the earth-dwelling Devas, the Devas of the realm of the four great kings raised a cry. 
the same thing they said na at Baranasi in the deer park at Isipatana, this unsurpassed wheel of the Dhamma has been set in motion by the Blessed One, which cannot be stopped by any ascetic or Brahmin or Deva or Mara or Brahma or by anyone in the world. Having heard the cry of the Devas of the realm of the four great kings, the Tavatimsa Devas raised the same cry, followed by the Yama Devas, then the Tusita Devas, then the Nimanarati Devas, then the Paranimita Vasavati Devas, up to the Devas of the Brahma's company. Uh, they raised the same cry, uh, namely, uh, at Varanasi in the deer park at Isipatana, this unsurpassed wheel of the Dhamma has been set in motion by the Blessed One which cannot be stopped by any ascetic or Brahmin or Deva or Mara or Brahma or by anyone in the world. Thus at that moment, at that instant, at that second, the cry spread as far as the Brahma world and this ten thousand fold world system shook, quaked and trembled and an immeasurable glorious radiance appeared in the world surpassing the divine majesty of the Devas. Then the Blessed One uttered this inspired utterance, Kondanya has indeed understood. Kondanya has indeed understood. In this way, the Venerable Kondanya acquired the name, Anya Kondanya, Kondanya who has understood. Uh, that's the end of the Sutta. So you see, when the Buddha gave this discourse, uh, out of five monks, uh, only one happened to understand uh, and attain uh, the vision of the Dhamma, that means attain stream entry. Uh. The others, uh, it took a few more uh, suttas, uh, they heard a few more suttas uh, before they attained, all of them attained enlightenment. But you see, when the Buddha set in motion, uh, this uh, turned the Dhamma wheel, uh, these devas, uh, they were happy you know, and they shouted uh, so loud. And one realm after another, uh, they shouted the same thing up to the Brahma heavens. Uh. Why were they so happy? Because many of them... Uh, must have been monks before, la, monks and nuns la, in their previous life. La. That's why they are reborn in the heavens. La. This uh, Indian belief, la, if you become a monk or a nun, la, it's natural la, that you be reborn in the heaven la, as a deva or a devi. La.